Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today we're going to talk about some of the general issue gear that the ship's marines would have had on board in the 80s. This is uh, sort of just a primer to a really basic loadout, but uh, if you guys enjoy it, we'll pull some more stuff out of the collection space and do another video in the future with some more detail. So, uh, Alice is hotter than Molly. So we're going to be talking about Alice gear today. That is the sort of infantryman equipment that would have been on this ship. So, uh, first off, what do we have in here? We have the uh, regular N81 woodland camouflage scheme uniform. This is a blouse and it comes with uh, trousers as well. That uh, seems to be the common uniform worn by the Marines on board. The desert camouflage was also around at that time, as was the uh, chocolate chip desert camouflage. I imagine in the Persian Gulf they might have been issued some of that, but by far photographs show this is the main thing. This particular uniform has something done to it that uh, I've never seen in pictures of battles of New Jersey Marines but we don't have a huge amount of those. This one's been raid modded. That's something that uh, started probably in the early 90s where because you start to wear body armor vests, you can't access the pockets on your blouse. So they cut the pockets off of the uniform. You can actually see uh, where the stitches have been cut here. And sew them onto the sleeve instead. And it's really interesting that they were field altering uniforms like this at that time because that's how uniforms are made from the factory nowadays. All right, what else do we have in here? Uh, your personal protective equipment. Uh, this is an M1 helmet. Oh, based on the liner and the uh, suspension system in here, you can tell that this is a, a very late model one, that this one probably made in the 80s. Uh, these seem to be issued up into the, uh, the mid-80s, and it seems like, at least for the sailors on this ship, they would have had the M1s throughout the ship's entire career. They never got reissued the newer uh, passing tank uh, helmets, the, the actual Kevlar pot helmets. They were always using the steel ones. The Marines probably started getting the Kevlar ones in the early to mid-80s. Uh, however, we do have at least one picture that shows a Marine on the ship still wearing the old style helmet along with the uh, newer style Pastig uh, flak jacket. So that's interesting that they were mixing and matching equipment. They didn't get issued the full Pastig uh, panoply all at one time. Now, here you'll notice you've got the goggles on there. We don't really see that on. Uh, the Marines on this ship, but they are certainly common in that time period. And uh, you can see that we've got the camo cover on here. It's held in place by a helmet band. Notice this one doesn't have the cat eye reflectors on the back that are common in this period. This is an older uh, Vietnam style band. And, and you do see mixtures of that old equipment and new equipment come out at the same time. Uh, interestingly, this one has the camo netting added to it as well. You don't really see that during this time period. What you do see is, uh, I've heard it nicknamed the, the Rastafarian helmets, the, the canvas strip camouflage uh, that comes off of these, especially in this time period, like the Invasion of Panama. Uh, we don't have anything like that in the collection. I've never seen one in person, just in some historic photos. It's a mix of whether you see the guys on here wearing body armor or not. Uh, oftentimes it seems like they were just wearing the camis. Uh, you do see them starting to wear body armor a lot once the plastic stuff starts to get issued. Uh, interestingly, we do not have a single picture that I've been able to find in our collection of the Marines wearing web gear. However, the uh, Alice style web gear, the LC2 gear, uh, also known as 782 gear or deuce gear because of the form the Marines would have to fill out when they get issued this, uh, was the common thing across the entire military during this time period. It is uh, really the final evolution of the web gear 
that you see start being issued in the World War I time frame and then gets modified through World War II, Korea. Uh, it's very similar to the sort of equipment you see during Vietnam, except instead of the canvas, it tends to all be lighter nylon. Here we have a real basic loadout of this. I'm just going to throw it on because it doesn't, uh, can't really lay it out on the table and show it really well. So, your uh, basic loadout, you have two magazine pouches. Each pouch will hold three 30 round magazines. Pouches, unlike mag pouches today where they sort of lay flat across your body, they would be the curved edge towards you. So they'd be stacked in here like this, and it would sort of cause the pouch to banana out like that. They also have two grenade pockets. Uh, while six spare magazines plus one in the gun is pretty standard, these give you the capability of holding four fragmentation grenades. Usually you only see two, or you see guys add a third one of these pouches on their gear and then fill that with grenades instead of having them in these uh, I don't really like these side things. They're kind of difficult to get the grenades into and out of. Uh, let's see. These are always pushed off to the side, so that if you have to lay down prone, you can. You don't keep them in front of you like, like most uh, setups today where you've got everything right there on your chest. Uh, and really, that brings us to one of the, nowadays you might consider it a drawback of the Alice gear, especially compared to Molly gear that they issue today versus uh, that newer equipment. This is designed for you to be walking around in a triple canopy jungle or to walk through the Volga Gap all the way to Moscow. It is uh, not so much designed for, I'm gonna get into a quick firefight, I'm gonna jump back in a helicopter and, and I just need my gear right here where I need it. So it is really great retention and suspension uh, the, the way the weight's distributed, the amount of stuff you can put on here, great, but it is very much retained. I can't very quickly pull a magazine out like you can in the uh, more modern pouches. So ultimately, I think that is the doom of this sort of gear as U.S. military doctrine starts to evolve. Uh, so let's see, we'll stick into the belt line. First of all, my belt is sitting right above my hip, so it's above my normal belt. You would typically wear a belt with these pants, so you don't want those two uh, hidden together. And, and sitting on my hips like this allows the hips to carry a lot of this weight. Uh, continuing around behind, we have two canteen pouches. That's fairly standard. Sometimes you see one. Uh, and you've got the Marine first aid kit. That is more of a uh, boo-boo kit than the modern IFAC. It doesn't have a tourniquet in it. It doesn't have a lot of this stuff that uh, you would have in it. And this is for self-care, it's not for buddy care. So you find your buddy on the ground bleeding, you don't take your kid out and start working on him, you grab his kit. So because of that, because you're often grabbing stuff from your buddy's kit, your, uh, the position of your gear tends to be standardized across an entire unit so that you know that everybody's gonna have uh, this right here. Some of these kits you might see with a butt pack on them, very common during Vietnam, really start to go out of favor in the, the 80s and 90s. So we don't have one on this particular vest. Uh, some of the things with the canteen pouch, unless you've got a little side pocket here, that's your iodine tablet so that you can purify water. Because it's a plastic canteen, I notice this style has the uh, hole in it so you can actually drink it through a gas mask. You can't put water in this and boil it. So you would also be issued a metal canteen cup. So you could put stuff in this and boil it. Uh, usually you would have two canteens, but only one cup issued to you. And a lot of guys would go out and they'd get a second cup. They, they've got room to carry them in their two canteen pouches. And then one would be for your hot beverage, your coffee, uh, and the other one would be for your food. We're talking about the Ubu kit back here. This one is cool because it still has it's uh, complete equipment in it. Okay, so we've got a bandage in here that didn't fit in this. You can see it's got a sticker so you know if it's been opened. And you, you've just got some band-aids and uh, bandages and that sort of stuff. Again, just a boo-boo kit. 
not like the uh, the individual first aid kits that you see carried by troops nowadays. But in the army, you're still being issued these pouches as your first aid pouch, and it just carries a single bandage. So that's all you have for individual first aid. So these marine pouches definitely a step closer to what we have today, but not fully there. Uh, now, since the Marines have that, they tend not to use these for the bandages. This one has your uh, lensatic compass in it, dummy corded, of course, so that it doesn't go anywhere. And uh, you see a mix of these being upside down like mine was so that the equipment just drops out or being right side up. Also here with the compass, you have your ear pro. So you keep your foamies in there, so that if you're going into combat, you can protect your hearing. And that's another thing that's pretty new during this time period for the American soldier. Uh, and then finally, you've got your moonbeam, the uh, standard GI flashlight here. Not many lumens compared to a modern flashlight. Uh, does have the ability to put different colored lenses in. I've got a red lens in right now. Extra lenses are stored in the base here. So you can actually, uh, this one seems to have what? A white, a yellow, a blue, and a red, and then you can mix those colors up to get even more colors. So your unit might use different colors than other units. I'm not sure that you would see this here on an actual rifleman, because how do you shoulder a rifle with this in the way? And of course you've got the uh, racetrack style carbiner, which is uh, fairly ubiquitous through Vietnam and uh, into the 80s and 90s. Uh, some other stuff in here. This stuff is great, but notice I've got all these extra straps and things. You'd always keep uh, some 100 mile an hour tape, essentially green duct tape, so you could tape this up. And then these stupid clips here that hold the thing in place, they're not so great, so you'd usually tape those up too. Also, you see how all the, the paint is worn off of this, that's going to reflect now. So cover that up with tape, cover this up with tape. Uh, Alice clips usually work pretty well, but remember you're being issued gear that has been issued and reissued for about two decades now. So you might need some paracord to tie it in place and retain it better. Of course, everything always comes in green. And then of course, uh, we've got strips of the foam sleeping mats that you would be issued. These are often cut up and then 100 mile an hour taped onto these to add additional padding, especially as these sorts of things are being issued and reissued and the padding's getting all worn away. So you often see modifications like that. You might even see guys uh, paracording these inside their web belts. It just gives them a little bit more padding there. And it's also gonna make your web belt a little bit wider so you've got more surface area for gear and more comfort when you're carrying stuff. Modern battle belts tend to have a kidney pad built into them already. Uh, so the, a lot of the stuff that these guys are home brewing during the uh, 80s is the same sort of stuff you see just general issue nowadays. So it's really cool seeing how this stuff, you, you can tell the evolution from the Vietnam loadouts uh, to what they're carrying today, even though the vests and body armor and stuff that they're carrying today is completely different. Uh, and then of course, Final thing in here, a couple different colored smoke grenades. You don't tell the pilot what color smoke you're popping, because Charlie might pop smoke too. You tell him to tell you what color he sees, and then and I pop yellow smoke, he sees yellow smoke, good, he's actually coming to my landing zone and not going to an ambush. So a couple different colors of those are always great. And yeah, so like I said at the beginning of the video, we've got lots of footage of, or, and uh, pictures of Marines on this ship. I haven't really seen any where they're wearing this equipment, but we know they were issued it, and they would have worn it if they had to go ashore or deploy for anything like that. Um, so we're not 100% sure how their standard operating procedures were for setting it up, but it would have likely been something very similar to this because this is fairly standard across the entire military for the ship's entire last commission. Again, this is just a, a really basic load out and look at some of the equipment that's on here. If you want to see uh, more in-depth stuff or some of the other sorts of equipment, we'll pull some more out of the collection space and we'll show you that stuff in a future video. Let us know in the comment section down below. Uh, 
I know a lot of you guys probably have memories of being issued this gear. Let us know your, your uh, personal recollections of it and uh, let us know what you want to see us talk about in the future related to this sort of Alice gear. Remember to always grind the nub off of your A2 grip. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourself. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to donate to support the museum. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us in the chat. Thanks for watching.